My name is Anthony K. Ruse. I'm an editor of the Stanford Law Review, and I was a former journalist for NBC. As we know, crypto has been a huge topic over the past year. Uh, Coinbase just went public. So I am just honored to have Paul Graywall, the CLO of Coinbase, and Professor Chris Brummer here to talk to us about crypto, law, and business. Paul Graywall is the Chief Legal Officer and Corporate Secretary of Coinbase, a company that I just mentioned that just went public two weeks ago. Coinbase is the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the United States and the first major cryptocurrency company to be publicly traded. Before coming to Coinbase, Paul was a Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at Facebook. And before that, he was a Magistrate Judge for the Northern District of California. Although Paul has had much professional success, he has also endured much recreational failure as a diehard fan of the Cleveland Browns. Uh, Chris Brummer is a professor of Georgetown University Law Center and the faculty director of Georgetown's Institute of International Economic Law. He is the host of FinTech Beat, an excellent podcast about technology and finance. He has served the public as a member of the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, and he is now a member of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. His work and analysis have appeared on CNN, Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal, and lucky for us at Stanford University. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I, I would make one quick, uh, uh, at the CFTC, I'm serving on their virtual currency subcommittee, but uh, it's small but, but, but important difference, but I, I, I appreciate the uh, shout out. Awesome, awesome. Well, we are so happy to have the two of you here. And as the audience probably knows, we have a wide range of people here, some who are uh, just starting to get interested in cryptocurrency to others who are running companies who are looking to invest in cryptocurrency. So I'm thinking we'll start generally with the crypto economy, move a little bit more to Coinbase, and then analyze some of the risks that individuals and companies are facing. So for, for our first question, I thought it was really interesting that in 2017, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, said the following of Bitcoin. If you're stupid enough to buy it, you'll pay the price for it one day. And as you may have seen today, this morning, Bitcoin or JP Morgan announced the launch of an actively managed Bitcoin fund. So I'm wondering why has Bitcoin become so popular over the past couple of years? I think Paul would probably be the best person to- uh... I'm happy to jump in. Thank yeah, you. I think, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let the resident expert here uh, jump well, in. Well, I appreciate that, those kind words, uh, Professor Chris Brummer and Anthony, thank you for having me as well. By the way, I, I have to put in my own plug for Chris's podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a regular listener and a big fan, so I encourage everybody else who wants to learn more to do the same. Uh, the, the question is, why is Bitcoin so popular? Oh my gosh. Um, where to begin, where to begin? Well, I will say a couple things um, about that, and then, uh, and then perhaps we might dig into some specifics. Uh, at the highest level, Bitcoin, I think, um, is, is popular today and was really um, popular at the very outset uh, after Satoshi's white paper, in, in, in large part because of this. It solves a fundamental problem, and that fundamental problem is the problem of trust. And you know, if, if, if any of you have not yet had the chance to go back and read the original white paper, I encourage you to do so. It's actually extremely accessible and it lays out um, in very plain language what Satoshi was attempting to address. And you know, there's a lot of fun guessing to be had about who Satoshi was, whether Satoshi was actually a real person or a group of people. I can confirm it wasn't, it, it wasn't me. Um, and maybe maybe Professor Brummer will confess today. I, I, I have a very important announcement to make. <laughs> okay, that would be that would make this truly a newsworthy uh, event. But but the but the but the problem of trust is really at the center of it. And and uh, I think uh, a, a a response to a growing lack of trust in traditional intermediaries and um, and central authorities. Um, Beyond solving the problem of trust, or at least addressing it in large measure, and I think we can talk about that um, in much greater detail, what Bitcoin does is it fundamentally addresses uh, 
the, 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 the longstanding human need for reliable, secure, um, and recognized mediums of exchange, stores of value, units of account. And you know, those are the three concepts that you'll see repeated over and over again in any discussion of what Bitcoin aims to address. And um, you know, it, it, it offered a unique, a, a unique answer to, or, or solution to those, those three challenges. Why is it popular today? Well, this is, this is really the last point I'll make that I'm eager to hear Professor Brummer's perspectives. Um, it's popular today because people, I think, have come to realize that uh, assets uh, aren't necessarily limited to things you dig out of the ground or things that you can construct with your hands. They really are, um, in, a, in a modern economy based on the internet, um, you know, as much about protocols and, uh, and recognized um, standards for, for, for encryption and protection as they are about anything that you can actually hold. Yeah, you know, and, and I, I think what I would maybe add with that, because it's, it's a little bit, you know, uh, of a challenge because you're trying to think about Bitcoin specifically versus, say, other, other kinds of crypto assets and cryptocurrencies. You know, um, uh, I think first it's useful uh, for even lawyers to sort of think about the moment in which sort of Bitcoin is is born, right? And and the fact that it, uh, besides the, the the technology, it was a response to a, a very particular moment, both in the economy and in the financial system. So it's a point of time at which um, you know people were both looking at the failures of the financial system in two thousand and eight. Uh, both from a supervisory perspective, um, uh, others from a sense of, of, of a shortcoming from a monetary governance perspective. And, you know, people were also looking at the response and the, and the extraordinary measures that were needed in order to um, uh, uh, really rehabilitate and, and preserve uh, our financial system. And, you know, when, when Bitcoin was first introduced, it was introduced not only as, as a technology, you know, not only as a technology solution, but also as a kind of a critique of that particular moment. And when you think about some of the initial adherents and the people who sort of jumped on the, 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 the Bitcoin bandwagon, they are, I think that they were attracted as much by sort of the vision of an alternative system where, you know, I think it's, it's, it's not, uh, too controversial to say, you know, that, that there was after the collapse of uh, the financial system in 2008, you know, a severe lack of trust in institutions, um, both a lack of trust in financial institutions, a lack in, in, in governments and central banks. Um, and, and, and so people were trying to think of an alternative um, means of addressing not only sort of a, a financial problem, you know, how do you, how do you move money um, uh, but but also, how do you do it in a way so as to speak to what were the perceived uh, failures um, uh, in society from a sort of, again, from, a, from both the financial, monetary, and, and, and regulatory perspective? And, you know, from that moment, you know, uh, where, where, where people were, were uh, or Satoshi was trying to think that through, and, 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 and you see it in, in parts embedded both in the white paper and, and elsewhere, uh, you know, as people started to both inspect that solution and, and its relative uh, elegance, uh, you know, over time, uh, you saw a, a community uh, being built. Now, now, that system, you know, can be subject to many different forms of, of criticisms, both from uh, uh, either regulators or other sponsors of other crypto assets. Uh, but it was the first, and as in many other aspects of the economy, being first kind of matters uh, and, and in terms of establishing network effects. And it, it was that, that head start, both from a, again, a, a kind of a almost philosophical starting point, but also from a technology standpoint, uh, where you saw Bitcoin able to eat into uh, and to jump ahead of other uh, crypto assets and, and other kinds of financial products more, more generally over time. And I think that that's one reason, or really two reasons, I suppose, why Bitcoin has a, a certain level of, of prominence in these uh, uh, sort of popular conversations. 
And Bitcoin was definitely first, and it's the one that's most prominent right now. But I'm curious how you would advise both individuals and corporations who are looking to invest in cryptocurrencies about how they should diversify their cryptocurrency assets. It's often said that there's Bitcoin and then there's the rest. But as Paul knows, there's tons of different cryptocurrencies that are being traded on Coinbase right now. Um, how should individuals think about this difference? Well, the only investment advice I ever give about how to think about Bitcoin versus other assets is to think carefully. What I can say is that, um, uh, you know, the you are absolutely correct, Anthony, that um, while Bitcoin is the most famous crypto asset, um, it is hardly the only one. And there are not only dozens and dozens, hundreds you know, available on any exchange of any note, whether it's Coinbase or otherwise today, there are thousands of different um, crypto assets now and, and soon to be tens of thousands. And I would hazard a guess that there will ultimately be millions of individualized coins available um, uh, globally in, in the near future. I think the right way to think about you know, what, what these different um, coins mean is to think about what different things these various coins do, or at least are, 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 are intended to do. Um, you know, there are some who feel that Bitcoin, have, uh, Bitcoin has some particular technical shortcoming, whether it's in, in terms of security, whether it's uh, in, in terms of some other vulnerability to attack, that can be solved with a different architecture or a different set of protocols. And those coins have gathered a certain audience and, and, and a certain popularity. Um, there, there are obviously next generation crypto um, currencies and assets based on blockchain technologies that are simply just more developed and more advanced technologies, Ethereum being a great example, uh, in which you can actually code smart contracts into the coins themselves, into the ledger itself, so that um, uh, all, all sorts of conditions can be automated um, that in, in, in previous generations would require some type of human intervention. And then I think the other thing that we're seeing with the proliferation of, of alternatives to Bitcoin is, is just a recognition that blockchain technologies more generally are now available to help real people solve real problems. These are not simply just assets for investment, um, but they can actually allow a worker in one country to send money home to a family in another or allow um, uh, certain artwork in the case of NFTs um, to carry with it rights uh, that, that, that stay with the original creator for all time. And it's those practical use cases, I think, um, that are that, that, as much as anything that's giving rise to the proliferation of all sorts of alternatives to the original Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to stay away from the investment advice, right? But but you know, because we are um, uh, obviously uh, being sponsored by the law review and by law school students and, and the like, um, you know, the idea and the question of diversification is is pretty interesting. Okay, so on the one hand, you're you're thinking to yourself whether or not crypto assets are useful for diversifying your portfolio vis-a-vis -vis other investments, right? And then there's this secondary question as to whether or not there needs to be, uh, or one should diversify, if, if you decide to have some kind of crypto asset holdings, how do you diversify your holdings within that basket of crypto assets that you may decide to, to own? Now, I think that the, the, the interesting question from a lawyer standpoint is just sort of thinking about um, a regime and a regulatory sort of ecosystem that's sort of developing alongside the, the market ecosystem is, you know, uh, whether or not, or the degree to which diversification is is possible, at, you know, from a from almost a, a legal technical standpoint, you know, in, in order, in other words, to to diversify any kind of holding, uh, investors have to have the information necessary, right, uh, about any particular crypto asset in order to make a judgment as to how one should uh, diversify that that portfolio. And you know, um, I, I would encourage uh, uh, students to and, and other lawyers who may be listening in to sort of think about that question um, because I think that that's going to be sort of a next generation issue that not only uh, regulators are going to be grappling with, but but so will um, investors and lawyers and 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 other uh, sort of participants in the ecosystem because uh, you know crypto assets 
can have very different uh, characteristics and, and features. And when you think about what are the material aspects of any particular crypto asset, where the, what's the material information one would need to know in order to make an, an informed investment decision as to how to diversify those, those assets, there, there are certain kinds of information that one would need to know um, that don't necessarily map neatly even into our existing um, securities law framework. Right. I mean, you know, so when you think about securities law and, you know, I, I apologize to any students such such as mine who, are, you know, are two weeks away from their exam and they're in there and, you know, this is probably, you know, creating a heart attack. But, you know, when, when, you, when you think about um, sort of the, the our, our, our regulatory disclosure regime, it's based off of industrial, you know, the 33 Act is sort of based off of an industrial company in a certain stage, mid stage of its life cycle issuing stocks to retail investors. And instead, uh, and, and, and stocks are themselves incorporated companies with certain kinds of governance mechanisms. And you know, blockchains um, and, and, and crypto assets operate in very, very different ways. And so what would be required in order to make an informed decision aren't necessarily those kinds of things that even in a securities law framework aren't necessarily gonna be prompted. Questions about your blockchain governance, you know, the importance of the development team, um, uh, you know, how do you describe a token when, when uh, you know, what you're looking for aren't necessarily claims to future uh, 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 payments or, or profits, but, but future services, you know, in the, in the case of a utility token. Um, you know, how do you describe the underlying technology? Um, what are the standards with which that technology and those descriptions of that technology you know, should be made in, in plain English. It's a kind of a securities law term that is usually applicable to very different kinds of uh, sort of fact patterns than, than one would normally anticipate in, in a token environment. And I'm saying this not just, you know, from a, you know, oh, you know, what's, what's the law going to be kind of perspective, but it, it, it's actually kind of relevant, I would uh, uh, think, even from the standpoint of sort of someone investing and 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 uh, uh, some lawyers or at Davis Bulk and I had actually sort of written this little article trying to think through what, what what kinds of things would be material or important and obviously that discussion leads in lots of different directions but it's useful to keep in mind what y'all mentioned earlier was that one of the main value propositions of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is that they're decentralized um, they're not an institutional creation, but we've seen that as cryptocurrency becomes more popular, there is an increasing institutional apparatus that's developing around it. Um, whether it's large companies where you can trade different cryptocurrencies, government getting involved in regulations, or banks deciding to invest in cryptocurrency, how should we think about the increasing institutionalization of an asset one of whose primary value propositions is its decentralization. Yeah, I, I think that um, that 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 observation is fair. Um, certainly, um, exchanges such as Coinbase fall within that spectrum of, of of institutional growth that you've mentioned, Anthony. And when you're talking about hedge funds, when you're talking about um, large corporations looking at their balance sheets and trying to figure out how much of their treasury ought to go into into, into Bitcoin, you're now uh, moving further and further from what I think a lot of the people who were first involved in crypto and in Bitcoin in particular back in you know 2010, 2011, 2012 may have been you know uh, imagining. Um, all that said, I think one of the real virtues of crypto, um, certainly as compared to more traditional um, financial instruments, is that there is a massive spectrum. Of, of, of options. And I think in, in a lot of ways, the market is going to bear out whether or not this growing institutionalization, as you, I think, fairly characterize it, is, is a net positive or a net negative for the proliferation of crypto assets like Bitcoin, right? If, if it turns out that um, uh, individuals uh, are disadvantaged in a material way, not um, having exclusive rights over their keys, for example, to control their assets, um, as is the case with a central wallet or a central exchange, um, those central wallets or central exchanges are going to do poorly. And I think you'll see a proliferation of um, self-hosted solutions or individual solutions, as was the case you know, in the earliest days. 
The other thing I think that's important about this growing institutionalization or this, I, what I would characterize as a growing range of options for, for, for centralization, um, or at least um, you know, means by which uh, people can in interact with the, the overall decentralized system, is that governments are going to have to react, right? Um, they're not going to have a choice, as I think Professor Brammer was alluding to earlier, to the reality that you now have, um, you now have um, tens of millions or more uh, of individuals, consumers, and, and their financial uh, wherewithal tied up in how these institutions are operating and behaving. Um, that comes at some cost to, to the system. And, um, uh, and, and certainly there are examples, even recent examples of rules and regulations, which we happen to think have been, um, if not antithetical, certainly um, um, uh, uh, hostile to the proliferation of, of Bitcoin and, and other crypto assets. But responsible regulation makes a ton of sense. Uh, that's the first point I make in any conversation I have with any regulator who, 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 who wants to talk about Bitcoin or other crypto is that in many ways, the right rules help everyone because none of us are interested in scams or, 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 or schemes that, that, that ultimately give crypto a bad name. But I actually think that this range of institutional interest that we're seeing is a good thing in that it will bring even more attention and I think more focus on what the right balance is that we, uh, we ultimately wanna see struck. Well, Paul, could you give an example of what good regulation would look like of these cryptocurrencies versus what would perhaps be bad regulation? Sure. So, 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 so like any number of exchanges, uh, Coinbase is a licensed entity. We happen to have uh, a bit license under New York law for our trust company, which manages the custody of our, of, of our customers' assets. Um, uh, while that regime, you know, is, 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 um, uh, challenging, candidly at times, you know, uh, in terms of you know our our interest in moving quickly to develop new products and services that we think our customers want. Um, I think it's it you know the, the concept of having a, um, an, a, a a regulatory oversight over, for example, um, what customer information an exchange has to collect uh, before setting up an account. Um, you know what monitoring um, 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 must take place. Uh, of activity on an exchange in order to make sure that there isn't criminal activity that may, may go undetected. Um, on, on, you know, in, on rare occasions when we're obligated to report suspicious activity um, under the Bank Secrecy Act, um, you know, I think it's helpful to have you know, federal you know, standards that, that articulate that in a, in a, in a clear way so that um, at a minimum, all the um, market participants are operating uh, with the same, you know, rules in place. Those types of those types of, I think, standards and, and that type of consistency that can come from regulation is a very good thing. And you know, and and I certainly believe in the um, overarching, you know, scheme of of consumer protection laws that apply to any any business, particularly a business that involves handling other people's money. Um, strikes me as, as again reasonable, responsible regulation that um, any 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 anyone should be willing to embrace. And Coinbase certainly is. Yeah, you know, I, I always make the joke that, uh, you know, uh, the West Coast makes it, New York trades it, and DC regulates it, and they all can't stand each other, right? You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very unique uh, ecosystem, and, and, and each with their, their very different priorities and institutionalization. Certainly, you know, there's a, a, a tension, um, uh, perhaps with the, uh, let's call it the decentralization ideal, and then you have the regulators who come in and uh, because of regulatory mandates could require, you know, a, a certain degree of decentralization. And I'll just use just one quick example. I think, um, you know, recently, uh, maybe in the last week, possibly, Wyoming came out with a new regime for DEXs and for decentralized exchanges to effectively incorporate, right, in, in order to, to, to do business, which is in, in and of itself a kind of interesting um, um, idea. You know, how do you create a, 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 some some semblance of a legal personality, you know, uh, for a decentralized exchange, right? Um, uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there are certain levels of practicality that I think are embedded in, in, in finance and, and, and the legal operation of any commercial um, enterprise, right? Uh, where decentralization sort of 
uh, you know, pushes on the boundaries at a minimum uh, of, of, of those particular uh, uh, concepts. And you have to figure out a, a way to come up with a, a smart uh, solution uh, uh, for that. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's so much to, to instill. I mean, that's, that's such a, a huge question. You know, um, uh, you know, I think it is useful. And I, I, I talk to regulators every day from around the world, many, I mean, more than 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 uh, than you think. So, and, and and I think, and I talk to CEOs as well. And I think that one of the challenges is that it's it's useful for everyone to sort of keep in mind what are the um, why do we have the rules in the first place? Whatever the whatever whatever rule you're talking about, you know, whether or not it's uh, you know your AML KYC rules under the Bank Secrecy Act, or whether or not it's you know registration of as as a security. You know why do you have those rules in in place, right? And I and I do believe that um, what institutionalization uh, does, and this is something that the New Yorkers are a little bit more familiar with, just because of you know you have a lot of the legacy infrastructure out 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 out, out east, is is that you know, when you're creating that product, they're sort of aware as to what the what the purpose of the rules are, even in, at the point at which they're designing the product, right? And um, sometimes, you know, when you're maybe because of geographic distance, it still kind of matters. And maybe, you know, the, the further away you are, a lot of times you're just saying to yourself, well, well, before you go and you think about what the regulatory regime is, very often an engineer just says, you know, this is a really big, important problem. Maybe it's a problem that has social significance. Maybe it's a problem where, hey, you know, economically I can do quite well if I can solve it, right? But they're thinking about sort of how do I solve the problem first, right? And and I'll just, you know, figure out those pesky details of, of the law later. And, you know, uh, uh, a lot of times, institutionalization for a variety of reasons sometimes prompts the regulatory and the legal questions a little bit earlier in the life cycle of product design. Um, uh, uh, and, I, you know, viewers can do with that what, what they want, but I mean, it's just more of an anecdotal kind of a, a, an observation. And the last thing is that it, what institutionalization does and what happens when you have institutional money, which I'll just kind of add, and this is coming from a conversation I had with Nick Carter, um, a while back, uh, a very smart guy. He said, you know, once you start to get more uh, institutional money into crypto, which has generally been a retail space, and this gets back to your first diversification question, does that lead to them bringing their institutional strategies from stocks and bonds and the like into the world of, of crypto? And does institutionalization in and of itself start to transform what the, the market Right for cryptocurrency starts to look at look like right because you have less retail investor acti driven activity but you have institutional activity and does that drive new forms of uh, uh, new kinds of correlation and and the like but there are so many different things and I'll just stop blabbering but uh, uh, institutionalization is big and it will be something that markets are grappling with which are their own form of institutionalization and and, and regulators as well. I really like, I just have to jump in. I really like the, 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 the suggestion that we return to first principles and thinking about what regulations make sense and what regulations might not. I think a related idea that is just as important is to, is to think through carefully all of the consequences from a rule or a standard intended or otherwise. Because I think that when it comes to crypto, so often in the, in the regulation we've seen so far, at least the proposed regulations that we've seen so far, there are many unintended consequences that often have profound, or at least could have profound implications for um, consumer protection and for proliferation of the technology. I'll give you one quick example, Anthony. Um, you know, in, in, in the last several months, the US Treasury has promoted a rule on self-hosted wallets that would impose for the first time all sorts of new requirements for gathering and collecting information on parties to a particular crypto transaction. Sounds like a reasonable concept in principle. Um, the, the Bank Secrecy Act and financial regulation really going back 20 years or more, um, Professor Brummer can I'm sure give that history, you know, is premised on this idea that we want to have um, responsible um, windows into 
um, commercial activity. And so to the extent that certain transactions suggest, for example, criminal activity, it, it, it ought to be incumbent upon you know, the parties to that transaction to at least collect that information, if not produce it when it rises to you know, a, a certain threshold. That all sounds reasonable, right? Well, here's the problem with a rule that says you got to collect all this extra data on parties that you're not even in business with, because these aren't your customers. These are your customers' partners in many cases. What happens to all of that personal information, that personal data? Um, what security measures are, um, are put into place to protect it, whether you're talking about the intermediaries and exchanges or the Treasury Department itself? And as we've seen in you know, recent months, the, the federal government itself is not immune from um, compromises and breaches which put uh, privacy and security at risk. So I think there are a lot of unintended consequences that also have to be accounted for when thinking about what balance to strike. I think you know, uh, so long as there is an open and honest conversation about those issues, well, we're, we're likely to get to the right result. But um, it's important to, to keep in mind that sometimes you, you get more than you bargain for with a new rule or requirement. Well, yeah, you know, and, and I'll, I'll 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 say a couple of, uh, because there, there's there's a lot in there, and I'll say just um, a couple or, or lend a couple of thoughts. Um, number one, you know, when you get into the BSA uh, stuff, uh, AML KYC issues, it's also important to recognize that you're dealing with both uh, U.S. government rules and also international rules. So, you know, if you're getting into, you know, whether or not FAT, whether or not some of the anti-money laundering rules should apply to decentralized um, institutions, you know, uh, what they, what comes out in terms of how particular entities are defined may or may not uh, uh, mesh, um, uh, with how they're defined in, in other particular um, sort of member. So there's something, think about uh, the, the you know, what Star Trek, the International Federation of Planets, right? You know, there's there's the FATF, which is sort of that version of that um, Financial Action Task Force. And so, you know, different star systems, you know, uh, are represented uh, over at FATF and they have different ways of looking at and defining different kinds of entities and how that's applied domestically can uh, can can differ. But I do think it's it's important, uh, even as new values are introduced into the conversation, um, like privacy. And by the way, I, I think privacy is a very important value. But it is always very I important to, to recognize, OK, well, why do we have the AML rules in the first place, right? Like from the stand standpoint of, 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 of market integrity, well, it's, it's because you know, we're, we're trying to uh, minimize you know, all of the bad guy stuff from narco trafficking to human trafficking. Uh, uh, to terrorism um, that could endanger uh, our lives and our financial systems, and, and and so the question is, well, well, how do you how do you get at that? And 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 the the, the great and interesting thing about technology is that you know uh, uh, technology can certainly create real uh, challenges, but it can potentially also introduce interesting solutions. But I think that what you know the, the own but because you want to make sure as a market participant to the greatest extent that you can, that you're internalizing what you're doing good and you're rewarded for it, but you're not externalizing what you're doing bad so that society has to pay for it, right? That, that, that you know, the great minds that, that come up with really interesting solutions um, that may have their own trade-offs also devote part of their intellectual energy to also figuring out, you know, how do you deal with those particular externalities? At the same time, it requires a regulatory apparatus that is both flexible and thoughtful enough, you know, uh, to, to, to think deeply about both uh, the challenges and opportunities of new technologies, and to figure out, well, well, how do you construct a, a, a system that, as Paul said, you know, gets you to where you want to go, and 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 gets you to to where you want to be. Paul and Chris, I want to transition the conversation a little bit from talking about regulations to some corporate governance matters that many individuals are also interested in. And we've been seeing a twofold trend. Uh, on one hand, corporations and individuals have been increasingly interested in investing in cryptocurrencies. We've also seen a rise of the ESG movement for very, very particularly in terms of environmental governance. And these seem to be coming to a head at least in the past month or two, as there's been more and more reports 
that Bitcoin mining uh, produces lots of carbon emissions. How should companies and individuals that are interested in cryptocurrency, but also interested in environmental governance, think about these issues? Yeah, I think they're, those, are, those are very important topics. And, and you're right that it is in crypto where I think you're seeing a lot of these things come to a head. And, um, look, uh, I think first and foremost, um, it's important to acknowledge that um, uh, mining can can in, in many cases consume significant quantities of energy. I think I, I think that's fairly uh, uncontroversial if you just look at how the protocol works, at least under, uh, in the original white paper. Uh, I'll put to the side you know newer forms of proof like proof of staking that uh, offer some alternatives to that more energy intensive approach. And it's also important to acknowledge that um, you know the 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 resources required to secure the the protocol and secure the network. Um, can come from uh, traditional uh, fossil uh, fuels that uh, are very carbon intensive and, and raise a lot of legitimate concerns uh, among those, not just in terms of ESG requirements and mandates co coming down on boards and so forth, but just from people who want to you know, be involved in technology or trying to do the right thing. I think at the same time as that's all true, you know, one of the things that uh, is very encouraging um, it, it, as, as we're starting to see um, crypto assets really proliferate globally is that in, in many cases, um, crypto and Bitcoin in particular can serve as a spur or as a, an incentive to development of non-fossil fuel resources, things like solar and wind power that have traditionally suffered from a very choppy, very um, unpredictable and unreliable demand curve um, that, that often inhibits you know, their widespread use and, and proliferation. And so um, I, I, for those of you who haven't seen it, I think it was Square that just at the end of last week put out a very interesting short paper on, on, on environmental concerns and, 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 and crypto, and, and they made some very nice points, I think, about how, um, in, in, in many cases, crypto can serve as a way to encourage less, less resource-intensive, more environmentally sound um, energy development practices. And so I think you know, this is just an issue... Um, that uh, every, everyone involved in crypto is gonna have to pay a lot of attention to. And even if it weren't the right thing to do, as you're alluding to Anthony, you know, many boards, many, many exchanges and others uh, are now insisting that companies do that. So I think you're gonna see a lot of development in short time. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I agree. I, I think that, you know, and, and this is, you know, for, for those of you, again, um, you know, who are in sort of the startup world you know, something like I kind of tell folks is one day, if you're really, really lucky, you will be able to scale and you'll be a big uh, company and you'll, and you'll be involved in different parts of the world. And, you know, once you get big enough, um, the, the range of parties that are interested in what you do grows, right? Because, because precisely because you're big and precisely because you're trying to get more customers and but precisely because you're trying to get more people to either operate on your platform or become your, your, your customers or your clients or your employees. And ESG is one of those um, areas where, you know, even if you're a firm and you want to, you know, uh, you, once you particularly decide to, 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 to go public, I'm not talking about Coinbase, I'm just talking about any kind of let's say a mining if a mining entity wants to go public or something you know all of a sudden now you have to think very seriously about asset uh, managers and other institutional investors who take ESG very seriously and in a world where entities are going to be increasingly brought into making disclosures about um, you know uh, potentially greenhouse emissions or the relationship to sort of how the climate uh, changes, you know, that kind of thing can be a little bit un uncomfortable uh, for, for companies and, you know, for their own business and uh, welfare, uh, you know, it's something that they're going to want to address uh, head on. And, you know, it, you know when, it, when it comes to, to ESG, I, I think that that's really important. It, it extends uh, 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 beyond um, uh, climate. I mean, I've been very sort of vocal about race and social justice issues. And the fact, you know, that once you once you get to a certain kind of uh, size, you know, again, you have employees, you have policymakers, you, you, you know, uh, 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 regulators, cons employees, and they care about these kinds of things and, and, and how you behave um, 
uh, ultimately can can really have a, a very uh, important impact on, on on your bottom line. And I think that at, there are certain kinds of growing pains that companies go through, and it, it's going to be very fascinating to see how that all plays out. But you know, when you grow, your interests are no longer just the, the VC firms that back you. Uh, if, if it's a much larger world, and there are many sources of um, uh, uh, both risk and, and, and opportunity. And I think that it's, you know, crypto is one of those uh, early stage uh, companies uh, or industries, they're reaching their adolescence, but just like as adolescents learn about uh, uh, authority in the real world and, 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 and personal responsibility, I think that that's something that, that the industry um, is going is is un, is currently learning about um, uh, uh, and 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 they're going to you know be be ultimately forced to to, to grow from. And many in the industry, they're not only looking at some of these environmental factors; they're also following a very prominent SEC case that's going on right now that I'm sure the two of you are familiar with. This involves the SEC and Ripple. And, and the question at issue is whether this particular cryptocurrency should be classified as a security or as a commodity. And this may be the, the, the first time in my law school career that I've gotten the chance to ask a former judge and a law professor for the facts of the case. But I'll go ahead and, and ask you for the facts of the case. What, what's at stake in this current SEC case that's going on, and what are the implications of a cryptocurrency being classified as a security versus a commodity? So I'll, I'll jump in with, with, with at least a few of the salient facts from my perspective, and I'd love to hear Chris's, Chris's views as well. I mean, what's at stake here is nothing less than you know the, 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 the legal definition of a security and whether or not um, XRP and, and potentially other crypto assets qualify as a security under the under the Securities Act of the United States, right? So, the 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 reason why that matters is that in general, um, securities need to be trade uh, traded on registered exchanges, and so to the extent that um, any firm is trading in XRP or any other asset and it is deemed a security. They better have a registration. They're not going to be permit, or they're going to be in violations of the securities laws. Um, I think that uh, you know time will tell whether or not the SEC's theory about whether X, uh, that somehow XRP qualifies as security is, is actually correct. That's why we have courts, um, and that's why we have um, you know a, a legal process to resolve those kinds of questions. I think in the meantime, you know, one of the thing that has one of the things that has struck me as much as anything about um, you know, that particular suit is that it um, signaled pretty clearly that the SEC is paying attention to these things. And um, I think that was true when that suit was filed. I think under the new chairman, it's going to be even more true that, that you know, these are now issues that are capturing the attention of the senior most people at the SEC and frankly, their, their overseers in, uh, in Congress. Um, and so, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I think this is a perfect validation of Professor Brummer's earlier point um, for, uh, to the industry, which is congratulations, you've made it. You're now important enough to matter <laughs> to, yeah. to the SEC and other important uh, regulators in the United States. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I, I, of course, as a professor, I was about to say, well, what do you think, uh, which is the very convenient uh, uh, response, but, you know, uh, uh, it 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 does signal a a coming of age. It does highlight, um, you know, the the fact that uh, this is going to be an issue that's going to have uh, likely repercussions for a range of, of for many uh, uh, crypto assets. Um, you know, I think there are attempts underway, and 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 they there certainly will be in the future. Um, you know, to uh, think through both the legal status of the out, you know, of, of crypto assets that have already been been issued, but you know, um, serious uh, uh, thinkers are and 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 market participants and regulators are also again trying to grapple with um, decentralization and 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 sort of you know what what 
okay, here's, here's, you know, just for the law school students studying, you know, you know, what does decentralization mean for the, the Howey test? There is no decentralization prong of the Howey test, and despite what, what people say, just like there's no legal definition of a utility token, you know, these are sort of terms of art. And even within the industry, you know, they are at times highly contested, you know, like what, you know, when is an asset or crypto asset uh, decentralized is a question that even market participants don't always agree on. And so, you know, when you, when you get to those kinds of issues and you, you, uh, you know, they become then legal questions, you know, how do you apply that, that doctrine is also going to be really interesting. Um, uh, many times, and what we've seen uh, over the last couple of years, you know, we have had informal guidance and it's useful to, to, to stress that a lot of that guidance is actually informal. And it's, it's uh, you know, there, there are different kinds of rules and regulations that carry the weight of, of law. And, and um, you know, one of the perhaps underappreciated actors in, uh, you know, the, the, the rulemaking process is, is um, as Paul knows better than any of us, you know, are our courts. And, and I think that that's going to be, uh, it's going to be highly interesting to see just how they come down. And, and even whether or not um, interventions by our courts also spur um, new forms of, of regulatory uh, responses and rulemaking or responses from Congress. So um, this is, you know, this is a baseball game. We're still very, very much in the early innings as to what this particular case is going to mean for the wider industry. Yeah. By the way, while we're all waiting to see how the case plays out, uh, for anybody interested in this topic, I really encourage you to go read Commissioner Hester Peirce's Safe Harbor proposal, which she just updated um, a short while ago. It really lays out, I think, a, a fairly compelling um, alternative uh, model for, for, for getting to the right result on so many of these new assets that are coming online. There's clearly a lot that the US government is grappling with in, in regards to cryptocurrency, but also cryptocurrency has become a focus internationally. And many people have been seeing what other countries kind of viewpoints are towards crypto, specifically China. And I was curious if the two of you could comment on China's policies towards cryptocurrencies and how different international actors' policies could influence how cryptocurrency investment happens here in the United States? I, I, I just have a couple of thoughts on that. One is I think it's obvious that uh, uh, China and, and, and other countries are not just paying attention to crypto, but in many cases pushing the envelope on crypto in any number of ways, whether it's in just the physical mining uh, uh, of the assets or in developing central bank digital currencies um, that in many, in many ways aim to rival Bitcoin and, and other um, decentralized assets. Um, the, other, the other thing I'll say just about the international influence or impact of all this is, I think, is, is that um, because, because crypto is inherently borderless um, and international by design, um, I think it's very important that um, whatever standards we develop here in the United States have at least an appreciation for, even if not, you know, perfect fidelity with, you know, the rules and re regulations that are being developed in Europe, in Singapore, uh, and, and, uh, and in other countries. Because um, for for crypto to achieve its full potential, it really does, I think, need to um, reflect a common set of standards that are available um, and followed globally, even if there are individual implementations that may vary. And I think when it comes to China in particular, it's very important that the United States consider the implications of a uh, crypto industry that is increasingly driven by uh, governments uh, outside the United States that may not share our values or share our commitment to certain um, fundamental principles that have governed our financial system for 200 plus years. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, the CBDC space is also really interesting. And, you know, we've only talked in, in, in our time, you know, uh, we, we use Bitcoin as an example and made sort of references a, a bit to sort of uh, DeFi and decentralized finance. But, you know, CBDCs, stable coins, other kinds of issues are, 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 are other really important um, uh, questions. And they're all going to bring about a, a range of, of interesting uh, legal and regulatory questions. 
you know, the, 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 the China uh, CBDC uh, question uh, is often um, framed and it's no surprise. I mean, in, in a way we, we have to think about, you know, just the, the, the geopolitical question that arises when you have um, what is the sort of central trading nation uh, given its, its, its uh, place in the international trading system deciding to suddenly go the route of issuing a, a digital currency. Um, uh, I would just say, and this is starting with Paul's initial sort of responses, when you think about what money is, right? The, the entry of China into the space particularly to the extent to which it may be looking to increase its share uh, in sort of the, the international uh, payment system based off of uh, better functionality, right? That's really interesting because when you think about money as a unit of account and you know, store of value, you know, uh, medium of exchange, you know, when you, when you start to understand that what technology allows is to both decompose each of those sort of features and then to add new ones, um, you know, that has a spillover effect into, uh, you know, uh, international monetary relations, not, not overnight or anything. And, 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 you know, getting back to Paul's central question of trust, I mean, you still need a central bank that is trusted enough uh, to be relied on and, you know, Bitcoin will say, just, you know, you know, can't trust anyone, you know, so we're going to create our own algorithm, you know, to, to kind of solve that, that, that problem. Um, but, you know, it is going to introduce uh, that question um, and, and it's, it's getting a lot of uh, serious attention, um, uh, even if it's not uh, something that's going to radically uh, change things overnight, uh, over time, uh, you know, pe people are, are, are thinking hard about, you know, what, specifically uh, uh, that could mean. And for crypto to really grow on the world scale, does that presume some level of technological infrastructure across different countries and reliable internet access in, in countries that may not be heavily invested in cryptocurrencies? You basically need two things, Anthony. You need one of these <laughs> and you need some broadband. And that, I think the fundamental promise of crypto is that with, with that infrastructure in place, any person can participate uh, in, in a global financial system in a way that was unimaginable even just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, 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 that, that's, that's, that's entirely right. And, you know, just to get back to, um, you know, just, just, just the larger point, you know, when, when digital companies want to scale, Right, um, you know, certain kinds of things that may not be immediately, in, for example, in your in your business line, could start to be important. You know, like what percentage of the world has broadband? Kind of becomes an interesting and important issue to you, right? If you want to expand internationally, and and frankly, domestically, you know, in terms of you know the access of um, uh, all Americans, you know, to certain basic uh, infrastructure can be very important to you in, in, in terms of, you know, just how far uh, and how fast uh, you, you can uh, uh, scale. And, 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 and obviously, you know, how do you think about your, your business and, and, and servicing them? But um, uh, I, I, I look at, you know, the interesting thing about FinTech, financial technology, whether or not it be crypto, whether or not it be a range of other, um, you know, new current uh, uh, innovations is that a lot of it is sort of premised on this idea of democratizing access to uh, higher quality, more efficient, more more secure um, uh, financial services, um, and and that conversation is one where uh, uh, when you talk about cell phone or broadband or five G or whatever it is, you know, it, it is. Um, and this is something that all of our regulatory agencies are coming to grips with and policymakers writ large is, you know, to what degree are those conversations, even when they're embedded in some of the parts of the DNA of financial technology, you know, at, at what point in the operations of the firms 
and in terms of their strategy, are you seeing that playing out in, in fact and, and on the ground? And, and you know, it, it, it's again, that particular question I find really interesting because if you talk to most regulators, even financial regulators, they're very much aware of this sort of first order question of, of infrastructure and access to infrastructure and, and, and trying to think through basic um, first order questions of what financial inclusion means or should mean in a digital economy. And, and what does inclusion mean, obviously, um, in, in, in broader questions of the uh, corporate workforce? Well, we're nearing the end of our conversation together. And I would receive many, many angry emails if I didn't ask a question about Dogecoin, which many people have been uh, asking me about and sending me messages about. And I, I guess I'll, I'll try and frame it um, I'll try and frame this in, in a certain way. Does the rise of like meme cryptocurrencies, the volatility and of certain cryptocurrencies that, that many retail investors get involved in worry you? Or do you think this may just really increase adoption and be good in the long term? Well, the only, the only thing I'll say about Dogecoin um, is that uh, I think P Professor Bromer's earlier comment kind of points the way for me anyway, which is, you know, fundamentally, this is all of crypto, including Dogecoin, is about democratization of access for, for communities and individuals that historically had little or no access or ability to participate in a financial system. And here's the thing about democracy. It's awfully messy most of the time. And, and I think that, you know, the rise of Dogecoin illustrates that point as well as any. So um, what becomes a Doge, I have no idea, but I think it, the, the widespread adoption um, of that particular coin, the meme culture that's uh, developed around it suggests that we're just seeing a lot more participation when it comes to crypto writ large than anyone could have ever imagined a short while ago. And I think on balance, taken as a whole, that's a very good thing. So I, I won't say... I, I, you know, I, 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 there's, it's, it's, it's a fascinating phenomenon, you, you know, uh, it, it does, I suppose, look, I, I, what makes crypto interesting, but also, you know, extremely, um, it's, uh, challenging is, is that it's highly technical, right? You know, it's, you know, the laws are kind of, uh, you know, are still, as much sort of in the mode of clarification as the technology is in development. And that does lead to an extraordinarily uh, high potential for uh, abuse in different parts, in different ways, right? You know, in terms of how you describe your technology, you know, for, for retail investors or retail people who just don't know or understand crypto, um, as I think what your comment suggests, you know, there's, there's a lot of froth in, in, all, in, in all of our markets. Um, but, but obviously, as I tried to explain to people, you know, where there's froth kind of depends. If, if, if there's froth in the housing market, you can kind of, you can see the house, hopefully, you can look at the house, you know, you can go visit the house, you can ride around the house, you can walk in the house, you can look at the house and, and make an assessment. And it's very concrete and it's very tactile. It's something that people can understand more intuitively. You know, um, yeah, crypto is like securities law itself. You know, I always make the joke, my students, you're not going to understand why you're even in this class until maybe the last two or three weeks, as opposed to say constitutional law or something else, right? You know, it, it takes a while to understand what you're doing. And, and, you know, that, that creates um, lots of, 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 of challenges, you know, where you want to protect the, the weakest among us and, and, and to make sure that you do have integrity while at the same time making sure that you have um, a financial system that adapts to a new um, digital economy. Dogecoin, you know, it's one of those things, though, where, I, you know, you, you get the sense that many people understand the basics <laughs> of, of Doge and, and, and they want to participate. And I suppose if they want to, you know, if it's, if, if people, you know, want to, uh, uh, you know, put their money into something that's a, a bit of a gamble, then, 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 then they can, you know, um, maybe there's, there's something there that I haven't um, understood. Um, but it, I think that the, the basic rules of the road should be to make sure, again, that people, whatever, you know, the merit or the lack thereof of any financial instrument, that, that people are, are properly informed about what they're getting, 
you know, and it's going to be, um, you know, uh, uh, major industries and, and companies have risen and fallen uh, with the inability uh, to make sure that their stakeholders and customers and clients, uh, you know, understand what they're doing. And, and I think that that's going to be, um, uh, you know, a, a continuing challenge, you know, and, 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 and a process that, that the industry is, is going to be grappling with, you know, in the, in the, in the couple of years ahead. Well, Paul and Chris, thank you so much for being here today. We're so privileged to, to have you here talking about cryptocurrency law and business. Paul, congratulations on the direct listing a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's an incredible occasion, not only for you, but for the history of cryptocurrency. And just once again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you so much.